So apparently you all enjoyed my first video. I guess I have no choice but to continue the adventure of James in the alternate universe where his parents are nice and his fiance non-existent. If you haven't watched the first part of this story, check it out because this one is a direct sequel to that. With that said, let's begin our new adventure, shortly after James completed his Kanto journey and traveled south. We awake to the beautiful white sandy beaches of the Orange Archipelago. The sun shines brightly and the salt splashed rocks from the sea... wait a minute. This isn't white sand. It's snow! We aren't in the Orange Archipelago at all! This is the snowy village where Jesse grew up. A ten-year-old Jesse recently flunked out of Pokemon Tech, the trainer school near Pewter City. Unsure of what to do next, she had considered heading to Sunnytown to join a biker gang. That was until some random trainer came to check out the school. James had stopped by on his Kanto journey to collect eight badges. After hearing her story and seeing how distraught she was, James convinced Jessie to not give up on her dreams of becoming a Pokemon trainer. Instead of heading to Sunnytown, Jessie instead made the long trek home to her foster family. In the snowy village, she would plan her new adventure to becoming a Pokemon master. And not for her birth mother who abandoned her to chase the legendary Pokemon Mew for Team Rocket, but for herself. This is Jessie's story. But before we begin the story proper, we have one big problem. Where is the snowy village? We can't exactly plan out an adventure if we don't know where it begins, can we? Determining the location for the snowy village was much harder than James's mansion, which I did in my first video. To come up with a theory, let's go through what we know of Jesse's childhood. Jesse was born approximately 5 to 15 years before the start of the Pokemon anime. Her mother, Miyamoto, worked for Team Rocket under Madame Boss, Giovanni's mother, and the organization's current leader. Abandoning her daughter so she could travel to South America, Jessie was left with a foster family in a snowy village, where her adopted mother, though poor, spoiled Jessie with meals made of snow that she called Snogus Boards. Jessie eventually left home to pursue numerous careers trying to find success and fame. The exact order of these is unclear, but we know she attempted to go to school for dance where she fell in love with a coordinator named Aston, who later left for Hoenn, become a nurse and trained with Chansey, but flunked out, went to Pokemon Tech to learn to become a trainer, but flunked out, joined a biker gang where she met James, and went separate ways with James but eventually reunited with him and met Meowth when they all joined Team Rocket. Now, if you haven't seen my first video, James not being forced to become engaged to Jezebel ended up having a big impact on Jesse's life as well. As I said, at age 10, he met her at Pokemon Tech and convinced her to not join a biker gang and instead return home. Which is located... well, I can't say for sure, but I do have a theory. There's one area that is close to the nurses' school Jesse attended, Pokemon Tech, and is well known for its mountainous snowy peaks. Mount Silver. Sitting on the border between Kanto and Johto, and only a long snowy hike from many important anime locations, the surrounding smaller peaks of Mount Silver could be the perfect location for Jesse's snowy village. Perfect location or not, Jesse's journey home from Pokemon Tech is not an easy one. It takes her some time to return home, passing through Viridian City and dangerous mountain areas to her remote snowy village. Though exhausted from the journey, her reignited passion for Pokemon has not dulled. Her foster parents welcome her back with open arms, and she tells them that despite failing at Pokemon Tech, she hasn't given up. She intends to do as James did, and collect enough badges to compete in the Indigo League Conference. Her parents smile, and are happy to see her so enthusiastic, but have some bad news. The Indigo League Conference just ended. It took me so long to get home that I missed my chance at the league, she says. Well, you missed your chance at this league, her foster mother tells her. But if you still want to compete, you'll just have to go elsewhere, to the nearby Johto League. If Jessie can collect eight badges there, she can participate in the Silver Conference and have her shot at becoming a Pokemon Master. There is another problem, though. Jessie doesn't have any Pokemon. Her foster parents surprise Jessie with a gift. A wild Pokemon has been breaking into homes to steal food, so they scrounge together enough money to buy their own Pokemon for protection. Seeing Jessie's passion, they feel that perhaps it would be better for it to go with her, and they give her... Ekans. With her first Pokemon, Jessie spends the summer traveling the mountains to train. 
It takes time for Ekans to warm up to her and for her to get used to battling with a Pokemon of her very own. She travels surrounding landmarks in preparation for her and Ekans' trip to Johto. Though it's of no note to Jesse, one area she trains in will, in several years, be revealed to be the former land of Pokemopolis, and also a contender for my favorite episode of the original anime. During her time training, Jesse finds her way to Mount Hideaway. Here, Jesse and Ekans encounter a giant onyx. She tries to pit her normal-sized snake against the giant rock snake, but it unsurprisingly doesn't go very well. Onyx's earthquake is so strong that it damages Ekans' psyche, not just its health bar. Ekans is definitely gonna have nightmares after this. And just as it looks like Jesse and Ekans are done for, out of nowhere, they're saved by a young, very muscular trainer who fights off the Onyx with his bare hands. He tells them his name is Bruno, and he came here to train before taking the test to become a member of the Elite Four. She asks him why he's training his own body and not just his Pokémon, and he teaches her a valuable lesson. If you want strong Pokémon, you need to be strong yourself. Jesse thanks Bruno for saving her, and carries a still shell-shocked Ekans back home. The fateful encounter is a double-edged sword, though. It shows Jesse what a true Pokémon trainer looks like, but also just how far she has to go. After a bit of time resting back home, it's finally time to head out to Johto. She's eager to get on the move and begin collecting badges, but her family insists on sending her off in style, with a huge Snogus board feast. Just as the family enters the dining room to eat, they see all of their delicious snow has already been gobbled up. Lounging back with a nearly full belly is the wild Pokemon that has been sneaking into houses and eating food. It's a Lickitung! How do you keep getting in here and eating our food? Jesse's foster father says, but his anger is nothing compared to his daughter's. Jesse is furious that this Lickitung ate her going away meal. She remembers what Bruno said about being as strong as your Pokemon, and just like she did in that alternate universe to a wild Saviper, she beats the Lickitung to a pulp. Probably not exactly what Bruno meant when he gave her that advice. Fainted from Jesse's attack, she throws a Pokeball and catches the wild Lickitung. You'll pay for that meal by helping me in the Pokemon League, she says. Luckily, the family lives in a village surrounded by snow, so Jessie's mother can put together a replacement meal in no time. After a Snogus board feast, Jessie is finally ready to head out. With Ekans and Lickitung, Jessie heads down the mountain towards Johto and her first real Pokemon adventure. Jessie finally enters Johto when she passes the borders into Blackthorn City. The beautiful mountainside city is, unbeknownst to Jesse, home to the most powerful gym leader in all of Johto, Claire the Dragon Master. Too eager to get her first badge, Jesse heads straight for the gym. Before she even gets inside though, she's stopped by Claire's two young protégés, Liza and Lance. The two young trainers came to Claire and Blackthorn to learn how to properly raise dragon Pokémon, and one day challenge Claire themselves. Seeing the young, clearly inexperienced trainer walk up to the gym like it's no big deal makes the two laugh. Jessie, not the type to allow someone to look down on her, pushes past them both and enters the gym yelling out, Claire! My name is Jessie, and I'm here for a battle! Claire, in the gym training a young Dratini, sizes Jessie up immediately. And despite Lance and Liza trying to tell her Jessie isn't even registered, Claire gives Jessie an offer. Alright little girl, let's battle. And you know what? If you can beat me, I'll contact the Silver Conference myself and get you entry. You won't need a single other badge. Jessie accepts and battles Claire's Gyarados with her Ekans. As this is a channel that aims to avoid gratuitous violence that would warrant an R rating, I won't describe the battle in detail. Let's just say Ekans lost faster than Trip in the Virtress Conference. Loser. Jessie storms off, leaving the gym with Claire chuckling at her in the background. Come back when your Ekans knows more than rap, little girl. Liza follows Jessie out of the gym, and though she's nearly in tears from how embarrassed and frustrated she is, Liza congratulates her. You know how many trainers are too afraid to even step foot in Blackthorn? Let alone challenge Claire? I've never seen anything like it. I've been training with her for a long time and have never won once. I've never even beaten Lance. So don't get discouraged. Liza tells her to travel down to Newbark Town to formally register and begin her journey properly. With Liza waving her off and Lance glaring from inside the gym, Jessie heads off to Newbark Town. On the way down to Newbark, Jessie realizes she's very close to the Pokemon Nurse School she attended before Pokemon Tech. Though she flunked out there as well, she decides to head over and meet up with an old friend. 
A Chansey Jesse had studied with is still there and greets her with open arms. Jesse pulls out the other half of the medal that Chansey gave her when the two parted ways. Apparently, Chansey's about to graduate and is meant to join a Nurse Joy somewhere in Johto. Jesse congratulates her, but can't help but feel a little sad to know they'll have to say goodbye once more. The two had hoped to graduate together, but seeing as Jesse isn't a Pokemon and couldn't learn the move Sing, she flunked out. Chansey, remembering how hard it was to say goodbye the first time, doesn't want to do it again. Chansey decides that it won't be joining a Nurse Joy. It will be joining Jesse. The two hug, Jesse ecstatic that her old friend will once again be by her side. Still in the outskirts of Newbark, Jesse and Chansey decide to rest for the night. It will give them both a chance to hang out properly, just like old times. However, when the sun sets and the moon comes out, Jesse and Chansey are attacked by a wild Pokemon. It doesn't hurt them, but it does steal Chansey's egg. The two follow the fast-moving egg stealer into the woods, and though it stays ahead of them, they're able to corner it against a rocky cliff. It's a Sneasel! Jesse wonders if it came down from Mount Silver in hopes of stealing Chansey eggs from the nurse's school. The Dark and Ice type Pokemon is well known for stealing and eating Pokemon eggs. Thinking that Jesse is too weak to stop it, Sneasel stole the egg without fear. However, Sneasel made one fatal mistake. It wasn't Jesse it should have been worried about. Chansey, inheriting some of the anger from her trainer, double slaps Sneasel within an inch of its life. Jesse catches the wild Sneasel to keep it from trying to hunt the other Chansey studying at the school. Though, having it in her party does worry her. One, will a Pokemon like this obey her? And two, what if it's left alone in a room with Chansey? Ooh, that might get ugly quick. Entering New Barktown, Jesse heads to the laboratory of the newly assigned Professor Elm. Having recently graduated from school where he studied under Professor Oak, Elm registers Jesse in the Johto League and points her in the direction of Violet City. He also offers her a Totodile, but it bites her hair immediately and she says absolutely not. Jesse eventually makes it to Violet City. Jesse heads straight for the Pokemon Center. As soon as she enters and the Nurse Joy's Chansey greets her, Sneasel forcibly comes out of its ball and tries to steal this Chansey's egg. A volunteer police officer runs in to try and subdue Sneasel, but luckily Jesse's Chansey comes out and double slaps it. The police officer asks why Jesse can't control her Pokemon. She says that the Sneasel was recently caught and doesn't seem to think she's strong enough. The police officer says trainers need to work just as hard as their Pokemon so they will respect them, and says the best way to do that is to win badges. He introduces himself as Faulkner and guides her to the gym which is led by his father. At the Violet Gym, Jesse battles Faulkner's father, a flying-type specialist. Jesse battles with Ekans, but it loses quickly to the gym leader's Pidgeotto. With the enemy using flying types, Jesse feels her best bet is Sneasel, and reluctantly sends out the Ice type. It's clear Sneasel has no interest in battling. At least not for free. Sneasel holds its hand out as if to say, It'll cost you. And Jesse yells out, Fine, I'll get you a whole egg buffet. Just battle! With a smirk, Sneasel agrees and fights. The gym leader's flying types are no match to Sneasel's super effective Icy Wind, and it defeats both Pidgeotto and Noctowl with ease. Though Jesse's wallet takes a hit feeding Sneasel his fill of eggs, Jesse can still celebrate her first badge ever, the Zephyr Badge. After viewing a Sunflora contest in Blooming Vale, Jesse heads down to Azalea Town for her next gym battle. Passing through Union Cave, Jesse sees dozens of Slowpoke. A hiker informs her that a migrating herd of Shelter are in the lower levels of the cave. Many of the Slowpoke from the Slowpoke well outside Azalea are here to meet the Shelter and evolve. Jesse follows them down, hoping to see the evolutions and maybe catch a new Pokemon. Watching dozens of Slowpoke and Shelter combine to form a herd of Slowbro is awe-inspiring, but Jesse notices a lone Shelter in the outskirts of the group. This Shelter is much larger than the others. None of the lazy Pokemon want to lug around such a large shell, so it's left without a Slowpoke to pair with. Seeing how sad it is to be alone, Jessie offers it a spot in her party. She tells the Shelter that, perhaps together, they can find a Slowpoke for her to evolve with. Rather than be by itself in the depths of the cave, Shelter happily joins Jessie's team, in hopes it can fulfill its dream of evolution one day. With a new Pokemon in her party, Jessie enters Azalea to battle the gym leader, Kurt. Specializing in Pokemon found in the trees of his orchard, he uses Apom, Pineco, and Heracross. Jesse begins the battle with her Ekans, who's able to dodge Apom's attacks by using Dig. A powerful bite attack is able to finish off the Longtail Pokemon. However, 
Kurt's pineapple emerges, and after putting down a layer of spikes, surprises Jesse by using self-destruct to take out Ekans. Kurt then sends out his last Pokemon, Heracross, who faces off against Jesse's Lickitung, who seems more interested in the fruit of the orchard, but is ready to battle. However, the normal type, damaged by the spikes, is taken out easily by the fighting type. Jessie's down to her last Pokemon and sends out her newly caught Shelter, knowing Sneasel is a terrible matchup for Heracross, and she doesn't have any eggs on her to bribe him anyway. Shelter is damaged by the spikes, but the large Pokemon's hard shell, empowered using Withdraw, proves too strong for Heracross to punch through. Using a combination of Clamp and Ice Beam, Shelter is just able to take out Kurt's Ace. This wins Jessie her second gym battle, and proves that sometimes, size does matter. So size does matter. With the Hive Badge under her belt, Jessie is also given another reward, a Fast Ball. Kurt says he creates his own Pokeballs, and that this one should be perfect for helping her catch a speedy Pokemon. Passing through Benitaville, Jessie attends a Pokemon Beauty contest. Hoping to learn more about raising Pokemon, Jessie witnesses a young trainer win the contest. Whitney! With her Clefairy, Whitney sweeps the contest, and Jessie meets up with her afterwards. The two chat, bonding over how much they love cute pink Pokemon. After hearing that Jessie is challenging the Johto gym leaders, Whitney tells her she can take Jessie to the nearest gym. Jessie travels with Whitney up to Goldenrod City, where Whitney introduces her to the gym leader, her uncle, Milton. Milton agrees to Jessie's challenge and tells her it will be a two-on-two -two battle. With the promise of a breakfast buffet of eggs, Sneasel faces off against Milton's Tauros. Sneasel's quick speed, mixed with the slowing effects of Icy Wind, allows it to run circles around Tauros. Sneasel wins using a series of powerful feint attacks. However, when Milton sends out his mill tank, not even the speedy Sneasel can dodge the cow Pokemon's rollout attack, and it's taken out. Jessie then sends out Chansey. Her bulk is more than enough to shake off the rollouts, so she and mill tank begin trading double slaps and stomps. But every time one of them takes damage, they're able to heal it off quickly with soft boiled and milk drink. Neither is giving up an inch of space to the other, and it looks like this is gonna come down to who can one hit KO the other first. Jesse tells Chansey to use a new move it's been practicing, and the off chance Sneasel tries to steal another of her eggs. Just as Miltank is about to unleash a powerful rollout, Chansey tosses an egg at it. Before Miltank can react, the egg explodes. It was an egg bomb attack. Miltank is taken out in one hit. With Whitney and Milton congratulating Jessie, she leaves Goldenrod with her third badge, the Plane Badge. Just outside Goldenrod, Jessie comes across a park where a bug catching contest is being held. Excited by the prospect of catching a new Pokemon, she enters. However, the bug Pokemon in this area are quick to run and she can't seem to keep up. One Yanma in particular buzzes around her, teasing her as she wastes Pokeball after Pokeball on it. However, Jessie soon remembers what she won back in Azalea, and throws a fastball at the playful Yanma and... Yes! Is able to catch it! However, despite no other trainer being able to catch a Yanma, Jessie only comes in second in the contest. The winner is this kid named Bugsy, who is able to somehow catch a Scyther. Of course a kid named Bugsy won a bug catching contest, Jessie mutters under her breath. He wins a sunstone, but Jessie, who comes in second, is given a random evolution stone, a water stone. Jessie offers the stone to Shelder, knowing it would make her evolve and become that much stronger, but Shelder refuses. Its dream is to evolve with a slowpoke like all the other Shelder it grew up with. Jessie understands and stows the stone in her bag. Passing through Akrutique, Jessie heads to the gym, only to find out the gym leader, Morty, is unavailable. He left that morning to stop some rogue Ghastly at Sprout Tower, all the way back at Violet City. Morty's family trains numerous students at the gym, and though he's not available, one of his students is. A young trainer by the name of Karen came to Ecrutique to learn about the mysterious ghost types they use. Clearly bored and with nothing to do, she challenges Jessie to a battle. Though her Gengar defeats Jessie's Lickitung with a nightmarish Dream Eater, she complains that the ghost types just aren't doing it for her. She wants to find something... darker. She leaves the school, walking right past Jesse with a smirk. Maybe come back when Morty's available. He might be more your speed. Clearly I'm too good for an amateur like you. And too good for this gym. Jesse makes a fist, but holds back her anger. She refuses to let someone get in her head after beating her, just like Claire did back in Blackthorn. Let Karen think whatever she wants. I know I can get stronger. Jessie whispers to herself before leaving the gym. 
But before she leaves Ecruteague, Jessie stops by an establishment owned by the Kimono Girls family. As Jessie, a fan of theater, watches the beautiful show, Sneasel can smell something, even through his Pokeball. He pops out, disturbing the performers, and runs off with Jessie yelling at him from behind. In the woods just next to the theater, Sneasel finds an egg. But it's no ordinary egg. It's massive. Jesse struggles to wrestle the egg out of Sneasel's claws, but luckily Chansey pops out in time to double slap Sneasel and take the egg. Sensing something is alive about this egg, and seeing no potential parents around, Chansey takes it into her pouch to care for, and to keep it away from Sneasel who's still got a hungry look in his eyes. With Chansey outside of her Pokeball to care for the egg, Jesse and her leave Ecruteague and travel past Remoraid Mountain towards Olivine City. Once in Olivine, Jessie heads straight to the gym to challenge the Johto League's youngest gym leader, Jasmine. As stated by the games and manga, Jasmine at this time was a Rock-type specialist who trained Onyx. Steel-types had yet to be discovered and or fully understood, so no Steelix in this video I'm afraid. Jasmine tells Jessie this will be a two-on-two -two battle and sends out her first Pokémon, Shuckle. Jessie sends out Shelter. Though Shuckle's defenses are high, its bind attacks do little to Shelter's giant shell, and it soon falls to a water gun attack. But against Jasmine's ace, Onyx, Shelter faces an unexpected loss. Onyx begins with Sunny Day to weaken Shelter's water attacks, which just seem to bounce off of Onyx now. With a powerful tackle and earthquake, Onyx is able to defeat Shelter. Jessie remembers when Bruno saved her from the giant Onyx at Mount Hideaway and freezes before the rock Pokémon. Sensing her fear, Ekans immediately comes out of its Pokeball. It remembers losing miserably against the much larger Snake Pokemon, and how it wasn't strong enough to protect Jessie then. The fear of that giant Onyx's earthquake still keeps Ekans up at night. Jessie can see the fire in Ekans' eyes, and it seems to dispel all the fear that she had. Jessie whispers to it, This is our chance to face our fear, Ekans. Today's the day you and I become strong, like I always knew we would. Ekans, inspired by the ambition and passion of his trainer, evolves into Arbok and unleashes a brand new attack, the very move that kept it up at night, its own Earthquake. When the dust clears, Onyx is down and out, and Arbok is victorious. Jessie wins her fourth badge, the Mineral Badge. On the outskirts of Olivine, Jessie and Chansey wait patiently for the ferry to Cianwood, but it doesn't arrive for hours. A sailor tells them of a different ferry that is heading very close to Cianwood that she could take right now. It just pulled in from some island to the south. Jessie decides it's better than waiting around and boards the ferry. The passenger deck is totally empty, except for one other person. James! Jessie yells out to him, and James turns around, only to... scream and immediately faint. This makes Meowth, who was by James' side, scream even louder in surprise but Jessie's able to catch him as he falls. When James finally comes to, he tells her, Sorry, I thought you were Jezebel again. How are you, Jessie? Well, I'm great, but how are you? Oh, fine, James says and sits in one of the fairy's benches. And judging by the lack of a biker gang with you, I'm guessing you're doing well? It's been a while. Long enough for you to compete in the Indigo League, I hear. Tell me everything. Well... It's a long story, but we do have some time to kill before the next island. James, Meowth, Jesse, and Chansey all get comfy in the ferry as James tells Jesse everything that happened to him after the Indigo League conference. Once James tells Jesse of his Indigo League competition and introduces her to Meowth, hearing him talk makes Jesse faint for a minute too, he tells her of how he traveled the Orange Archipelago. Leaving his parents' mansion near Fuchsia City, James, Meowth, and his Pokémon traveled south. The goal was to reach the Orange Archipelago and have a new adventure. Unlike hiking around Kanto, the archipelago wasn't an easy place to travel to, though. He made it to the Seafoam Islands with ease, however, when it came time to swim down to the archipelago on Gyarados's back, even with calm waters, James got lost in the vast ocean. James and his Pokémon ended up stranded on an empty island. New Island. Luckily, a research team arrived not long after to begin construction on a new facility. Apparently, they were being funded by the CEO of the world's foremost Pokémon theme park. The head researcher, Dr. Zagger, and his assistant, a young Dr. Fuji, give James a map with proper navigational tools to help travel through the archipelago. However, James can't help but get a weird vibe from them, especially Dr. Zagger. 
Whenever he asks them what they're researching or who they work for, he finds a way to avoid the question. When Dr. Zager sees that Meowth is able to talk, the first Pokemon he'd ever seen with the ability, his eyes get wide with excitement. He definitely made James and Meowth feel uncomfortable, and when Dr. Zager offered them a ride back to the mainland at Old Shore Wharf, they quickly declined. As soon as they could, they got on Gyarados' back and headed down to the nearest Orange Island, Hamlin Island. Hopefully that will be the last they ever see of Dr. Zager and whatever team he works for. On Hamlin Island, James learns of the Orange League. He's hesitant to sign up for another league competition, but hearing about how different it is compared to other leagues, and with some encouragement from Meowth and Growly, James decides to sign up. There are four Orange League badges to get, and the sooner he begins, the better. He heads first to Kumquat Island, which is known for their luxurious seaside resorts. After spending so long at sea, James and his Pokémon relax in one of the many resorts before heading off to the Kumquat Gym. Here, they meet Luana, the gym leader. Though currently pregnant with the soon-to-be-named Travis, she's more than up for taking on challengers. She tells James that her gym is about coordination and teamwork. He must win against her in a double battle, James's first ever. Luana uses her Alakazam and Marowak, and James sends out Haunter and Ditto. James feels the two Pokémon's love of pranks and games will mesh perfectly for his first double battle. Ditto begins by transforming into Luana's Alakazam. James's Ghost type and newly changed Psychic type feel like the ideal pairing. However, Luana's Pokémon have battled together for years and coordinate their attacks perfectly. Alakazam's Reflect and Teleport seem to stop any attack Ditto and Haunter throw at them, and Marowak's Bone Meringue does incredible damage. If James is going to win this match, he has to find a way to overpower Alakazam's defenses. James decides the best way is to focus on his Pokémon's strengths, being goofballs. Haunter, making funny faces, distracts Alakazam long enough for Ditto to sneak up on it and grab it from behind. Using Teleport, Ditto transports itself and Alakazam into the sky. With Alakazam out of the picture for a moment, Marowak has no defense against Haunter's hypnosis. Asleep and attacked by a powerful Dream Eater, Marowak is defeated before Alakazam and Ditto crash back to the ground. Ditto avoids the damage by transforming into Haunter and floating away with a chuckle. With Marowak defeated and Alakazam knocked out from the fall, James has beaten Luana. He has his first Orange League badge, the Jade Star Badge. On the way to the next island with the gym, James stops off on the nearby Shamudi Island. A passing sailor informs him that they're having their annual Legends Festival to celebrate the god of the ocean, Lugia. The island is alive with music, dance, and food, and James and all his Pokémon join in on the fun. Meowth, in particular, indulges in the food a bit too much and walks away from the group to find a place to sleep it off, so he can then come back and eat more. Just outside of the festival grounds, Meowth comes across a lone slowpoke near a shrine. It's looking off into the distance towards three nearby mountainous islands. Meowth tries to chit-chat with it, but all it seems to want to talk about are prophecies and coconuts. James comes by, looking to see where Meowth ran off to, but trips and stumbles on the rocky terrain. One of his Pokeballs flies towards Meowth and Slowpoke, and hits Slowpoke right in the head. Unexpectedly, and completely by accident, James catches himself a Slowpoke. It's transported directly to his grandparents, who are also caring for his Carnivine at the moment, who he decides to add to the party for the next gym. After another day of partying, James leaves Shamudi and soon arrives at Naval Island. He's told by the gym leader Danny that before they compete, James must prove his strength by climbing a mountain. Also, side note, unlike in the anime, let's say Danny isn't a creep who hits on kids and pretend he's a good person. I've seen lots of beautiful things in these islands, but nothing as beautiful as you. Beautiful as me? You are a fast mover, please have a seat right there. James's Pokémon cannot help him climb to the top, but Meowth says he will make the climb with James to keep him motivated. Of course, by this he meant sit on James's shoulders and tell him to climb faster, but I suppose it works, because James makes it to the top completely unharmed. The gym itself is a best of three competition. The first round requires both trainers to use one Pokémon to freeze a geyser of hot water. James doesn't have any Pokémon who know Ice-type attacks, but he does have Ditto. Ditto transforms into Danny's Nidoqueen, and the two use Ice Beam to freeze the geyser. 
Unfortunately, Ditto has less experience with the move and finishes only a few seconds before Danny, meaning James loses the first round. But in the second round, where both trainers must use three Pokemon to carve the frozen geyser into a sled, James is able to win thanks to Nidoqueen's Double Kicks, Growly's Flamethrower, and Carnivine's Vine Whip. Meowth does mention that James could have won even faster if he was allowed to use Fury Swipes, but Meowth doesn't want to get his paws cold. The last round, which will decide the winner, has both trainers race down the mountain on the sleds they just constructed. James rides in the sled with Growly, Carnivine, and Weezing. The race is neck and neck down the mountain, but as they both reach a rocky section, Danny's able to pull ahead slightly. But James has an idea to get ahead, and above. He tells Growly to hold in a flamethrower to heat up his body right below Weezing, allowing the levitating Pokemon to float higher than normal. With Weezing then tethered down by Carnivine's vines, the sled is able to float just above the rocky surface. James doesn't slow down and is able to get ahead of Danny. In his own makeshift, well, hot air balloon, James is able to win the race and earn his second badge, the Sea Ruby Badge. Before heading to the next gym, James and Meowth stop off at Mandarin Island South. Exploring the island, they come across a moving company. A girl just moved here and introduces herself thinking James is one of her new neighbors. She says her name is Lorelei, but some people call her Prima. She's studying Pokemon and tells him she moved here from the Sevi Islands to start a new job. James tells her he isn't a local, but a trainer competing in the Orange League. Lorelei says, Oh, that means you'll be on your way to Pomelo Stadium soon. How exciting. Well here, let me help you out and mark on your map the island with the next gym. James thanks her, happy he didn't have to admit he had gotten lost again and needed directions. She still has a lot of unpacking to do, so he decides to move on. They part ways, Lorelai wishing James best of luck on the rest of his journey. James heads to the island Lorelai marked for his next gym challenge, Valencia Island. In the anime, Rudy on Trevita Island would be the next gym, but I believe at this point Rudy would be far too young to be a gym leader. Instead, at this point in time, one of the Orange League gym leaders is none other than Professor Ivy. Well, not exactly. She isn't a professor just yet. Ivy is currently doing research for her professorship on Valencia Island, where the Pokémon have unique regional variants. When James arrives, Ivy explains the rules of her gym. Unlike many other gyms, this one tests more than a trainer's battling skills. Ivy, hoping to become a professor in the future, started this gym believing traveling trainers could help in her research. The Valencia Gym Challenge is this. A trainer and one of their Pokémon must travel the island in search of unique looking Pokémon. Ivy gives James a scorecard with four Pokémon listed on it and a camera. He must locate these four Pokémon and snap a picture of them. If he can find all four and make it back before sundown, the badge is his. James chooses Growly to join him on the Valencia scavenger hunt. They've been together almost their whole lives, and Growliths are known for their amazing sense of smell and tracking abilities, so he's the perfect choice. He's also such a good boy! James and Growly are able to check off Pokémon quickly. First Raticate, then Butterfree, then the tricky Paris who is hiding within the foliage. All that's left to find is Vileplume, but both luckily and unluckily for the two, a Vileplume finds them. But this isn't a normal vile plume. The grass type is nearly the size of a tree. Perhaps a rogue Pokemon who somehow got to Valencia from Fairchild Island, where Pokemon grow to huge size, the giant vile plume attacks James and Growly. Growly remembers vividly the beating it took from Jezebel's vile plume in the league and is ready to prove how much it's grown. Despite the size difference, when James turns to run, Growly stands his ground. With all of its experience fighting this type of Pokémon, Growly dodges stun spores with ease. Fueled by fiery revenge, Growly uses Fire Blast for the first time ever to defeat the rogue, giant Vileplume. It howls in victory. Taking a picture of Vileplume, James earns his third badge, the Spike Shell Badge. But seeing the fire behind Growly's eyes not die down, even after defeating Vileplume, makes James worry. He hopes Growly doesn't let his anger from past losses get the better of him. After Valencia Island, James stops off at Pinkin Island, hoping to give his Pokémon, especially Growly, a break. However, the island has recently become off-limits due to poachers being rampant in the area, so they must leave before anyone gets a proper rest. 
Growly seems as fiery as before, and Gyarados also seems worn out from traveling the high seas. At Meekin Island, James has his final gym battle against the newest gym leader in the Orange League, Sissy. She says that to win her badge, James must compete in two challenges. The first is a sharpshooting challenge using water Pokemon, and the second is an open sea race. James is worried about using Gyarados in both rounds considering how tired it is from swimming island to island, and not getting a break at Pinkin. Because James absolutely needs Gyarados for the second round, he decides to give his only other water Pokemon its first shot at the big leagues. He sends Ditto to his grandparents, and brings out the Pokemon he caught by mistake, Slowpoke. Slowpoke takes its place next to Sissy Seedra, seemingly unfazed by how important this match is. However, as though it actually does understand the stakes perfectly, once James orders it to use Water Gun, it snipes each of the cans before Seedra can even get through half of them. James is just as stunned as Sissy. There may be more to this lazy looking Pokemon than meets the eye. In the second round, thanks to the short break Slowpoke was able to give Gyarados, the dragon is more than ready to race against Sissy's Blastoise. Blastoise is clearly happy it doesn't have to actually battle Gyarados, intimidated just by the look in the sea monster's eye. When it comes to the race, the two are neck and neck for the first half. The turn comes and Blastoise sneaks ahead as Gyarados can't turn as quickly, nearly falling over. But with a mighty roar, Gyarados uses Dragon Rage to create just a teeny tiny tsunami. With the added boost of the wave, Gyarados flies past Blastoise and crosses the finish line. Sissy, a little anxious to get Gyarados off of her island as soon as possible, gives James his final badge, the Coral Eye Badge. With all four Orange League badges, James heads off to Pomelo Stadium to challenge the final gym leader. Before heading into Pomelo though, James stops off at a deserted island to give Gyarados a well-deserved rest. While swimming in a freshwater spring, James finds a huge patch of wild salvio weed. A powerful medicine that can alleviate paralysis, James picks a bunch of it and puts it in his bag. Though it smells a little funky, you never know when it might come in handy. On Pomelo Island, James with all four Orange League badges is ready to face off against the head gym leader in a 6 on 6 battle. Another first for James. He enters the stadium museum, expecting to meet the head gym leader prior to their match. However, he's instead greeted by Lorelei. Well hello James, you got all four badges I assume? Yeah, it wasn't easy, but me and my Pokemon managed to do it. Oh, I knew you would. That's why I came straight here right after we met. Gave me plenty of time to prepare before our match. Oh that's smart, so then we can- Wait, what? You're the head gym leader? That's right. At this point in time, the current head gym leader is none other than the soon-to-be Elite Four member, Lorelei. To be clear, there's nothing in the anime or manga that says Lorelei was ever a part of the Orange League. However, considering how strong of a trainer she is, her assumed age, and the fact that she grew up in the Sevi Islands and moved to the Orange Archipelago, makes it seem like a perfect fit for her to have gotten her start here instead of the Indigo League. This might be James's toughest battle yet. Though Slowpoke proved itself against Sissy, James chooses to replace him with Ditto prior to the match. On the video call with his grandparents, he can tell that Haunter's upset to not be participating in the battle, but James assures him there will be more chances in the future. Haunter still pouts, making James realize for the first time that Haunter really likes battling a lot more than he expected. With a roaring crowd around them, including a cheerleading Meowth, James and Lorelai enter the arena at Pomelo. Lorelai wishes James good luck, but that she won't be holding back. She sends out her first Pokemon, Dugong, and James sends out Carnivine. Though Dugong is part water type, its super effective Aurora Beams are almost too much for Carnivine to handle. They exchange bullet seeds and Aurora Beams, doing just as much damage to the arena as they are to each other. Soon, both are knocked out by simultaneous hits. Lorelai's clearly not to be underestimated. She then sends out Jinx, and James sends out Nidoqueen. Lorelai believes Jinx, an Ice and Psychic type, will have no problem dispatching the Ground and Poison type. But James wastes no time, and orders Nidoqueen to use Giga Impact. Surprised by the sudden and powerful attack, Jinx is knocked out in one shot. However, James can't celebrate yet. He knows that Nidoqueen will need a minute to recover and can only hope that she can withstand an attack from Lorelai's next Pokemon. And she sends out a Swinub? 
The tiny pig Pokemon looks almost invisible next to the massive Nidoqueen. James sighs, relieved that Nidoqueen will be able to recover from the Giga Impact. Until Lorelei orders Swine up to use Sheer Cold. Even audience members in the back row feel a chill down their spine as the arena freezes over. Nidoqueen's taken out instantly. James berates himself for underestimating even a single one of Lorelei's Pokemon. He sends out Weezing to battle Swinub. Knowing he can't afford to let Weezing take a hit from sheer cold, he doesn't order Weezing to use Bide. Instead, covering the area in smoke screens, Weezing's able to defeat the small Pokemon with a surprise takedown. However, the powerful attack leaves Weezing damaged from recoil as Lorelei sends out her next Pokemon, Lapras. Though Weezing's able to get in a sludge attack, it's defeated soon by Lapras's Blizzard. James believes the only way to withstand one of Lapras's attacks is to resist it, and sends out Ditto who transforms into Lapras. Resistant to any ice or water attacks, Ditto should be able to damage Lapras, but Lorelei was prepared for even this strategy. She orders Lapras to use Thunderbolt and knocks out Ditto with one shot. James believes Growly would be a good match for the Ice type, but as Lapras and Growly begin exchanging attacks, James can see there's something off with him. He's moving frantically and taking bigger risks to do damage. James can't tell what's gotten into Growly since coming to the Orange Islands, but is worried. He recalls Growly and sends out Gyarados. Lorelei chuckles and prepares to defeat Gyarados with a quad effective Thunderbolt. But before she can, Gyarados uses Hyper Beam. The powerful attack shatters part of the arena floor, sending ice and dust up into the air. Gyarados is stuck from recharge, but believes he at least was able to take out Lorelei's ace. Until the dust settles, and he sees Lapras is still standing. Damaged heavily, but still in fighting condition, it uses Thunderbolt on Gyarados. Smoking from the electric attack, Gyarados is about to be declared unfit to battle. But as Gyarados faints, perhaps driven to avoid a repeat of the Lapras battle it had in the Indigo League, falls forward towards Lapras and bites down on it. No matter how the ice type moves, it can't shake off Gyarados. Somehow, despite already being knocked out, Gyarados' bite attack is able to do enough damage to take Lapras out with it. Down to his last Pokemon, but a little shaken by the intense level of battling, James sends Growly back out. The fire behind its eyes hasn't died down, and against Lorelei's Cloyster, it shrugs off water gun attacks like they're nothing. After a takedown, Cloyster uses a surprise payback, but the dark type move seems to only make Growly stronger? Growly's ability is revealed to be justified, powering him up after being hit by a dark type attack. This gives a second takedown the attack needed to defeat Cloyster. Lorelei sends out her final Pokemon, Slowbro. James's heart sinks. Another water type? Growly doesn't have any moves effective for this. What can he do? James remembers how damaged Nidoqueen and Gyarados got in the Indigo League and considers forfeiting right then and there, but his best friend doesn't give up. He shoots out Fire Blast after Fire Blast against Slowbro, but it douses each one with Hydro Pumps. Nothing Growly does can even touch Slowbro. James can tell Growly's pushing itself extremely hard. He can picture the puppy Pokemon imagining all the losses it faced in the past and wanting to stand by James as his reliable partner. But James yells to Growly to calm down, to not worry about disappointing him. That he'd rather lose than see his best friend so overwhelmed. Growly stops unleashing Fire Blast after Fire Blast and centers himself. Letting his fire burn within, he becomes engulfed in flames. James immediately becomes scared, until Growly's eyes open and he charges forward against Slowbro. Still powered up from Justified, Growly delivers an incredibly strong Flare Blitz. Though damaged immensely from all of the recoil, Growly stands tall as Slowbro faints. His eyes are still bright from an inner fire, but unlike before, Growly's in control. It's no longer a wildfire. Growly's growing up, and James is declared the winner. Meowth jumps out of the stands and runs towards the two. James and Meowth hug a pretty bruised up Growly, who winces a little but howls with excitement. Lorelai commends James for how driven his Pokemon are, and says that she expects great things from him. The audience gives a thunderous applause as James is crowned champion of the Orange League. The next day, James speaks with Lorelai at the Pokemon Center as both of their teams are healed. He says he's ready to head somewhere else to see more Pokemon and have a new adventure. Lorelai tells him to head to Terrico Island and board a ferry that will be following a herd of Lapras as they migrate to the region of Johto. 
James says it sounds perfect and takes the ferry. It passes through open ocean and the southern tip of Johto before finally taking port in Olivine City, where James waited patiently, only to be shocked by a sudden appearance of who he thought was Jezebel. And that's when I fainted and woke up shortly after and said, Sorry, I thought you were Jezebel. Yes, James. I was here for that. Oh, that's right. I can't believe what you went through at the Orange League. It sounds amazing and terrible all at once. Pokemon journeys seem to be like that, I suppose. But you learn from each mistake and discover what not to do ever again. After they wake up Meowth, who fell asleep during the story, they get off the ferry at Blue Point Isle. Jesse asks what James will do now, and he says, Well, if you don't mind, I'd love to travel with you for a while. James is curious to see the differences between the Johto and Kanto leagues, and Jesse is more than happy for the company. Though Meowth is a little wary about how much Jesse looks like Jezebel, he agrees with the plan. Jesse, James, and Meowth head to a smaller ferry port to take them the rest of the way to Cianwood. However, they say the ferry won't be heading out due to some terrible weather. James looks off in the distance and says that not even Gyarados could swim through that. The trio have no choice but to bunker down here for a few days. At the Pokemon Center, however, they hear of an event that might make their stay a little more interesting. The World Cup. Nurse Joy tells them that they came at the perfect time. The Water Pokemon Tournament is being held, and though it takes some convincing for James from Jesse, they both decide to try and win the prized Mystic Water. Jesse with her Shelter, and James with his Gyarados and Slowpoke enter the tournament. In the first round, Jesse's Shelter overtakes the local Harrison's Quillfish, who laughs off the loss and says, There's always the next tournament. James faces off against a trainer named Lola, who you may recognize as Brock's mother, the water-type specialist who left Flint while Brock was still young. Gyarados has no trouble defeating her poor little polywag, sending James and Jesse both into the second round, and revealing a big problem. The second round requires two water Pokémon, and Jesse only has one. While Jesse, James, and Meowth relax in the inn, with Lickitung jumping out of its Pokéball to eat James' specialty Pokémon food, Jesse tells them that she doesn't need a second water Pokemon. As long as Sheldon never loses, no one will figure out she's one Pokemon short. James says, that's a lot of pressure to put on just one Pokemon. Yeah, that much pressure will crack even Sheldon's shell, Meowth says. But Jesse is convinced that Sheldon will live up to her expectations and goes to sleep excited for the next day's competition. She sleeps so soundly, she doesn't even hear someone going through her bag. The next day, James faces off against a trainer named Aiden, who will one day become a firefighter on Escorbia Island, but his war turtle is taken out by Slowpoke Psychic, and his Squirtle faints just at the sight of Gyarados. James moves on to the next round. Next up is Jessie. She faces off against a trainer named Yusin. Obsessed with the Pokémon Suicune, Yusin hopes to win the Mystic Water and try to use it to lure out the legendary dog. He sends out a Cloister, and Jessie sends out... Another Cloister? Jesse's shocked! What happened? You see, the night before, Shelder overheard how much Jesse believed in it, but all Shelder could remember was how alone it felt back in Union Cave when none of the Slowpoke chose to evolve with it. Shelder became worried that if it lost, Jesse would abandon it. It went into Jesse's bag, not an easy task for a shellfish, and found the water stone she won in the bug catching contest. Without Jesse's knowledge, Shelder evolved itself into Cloister, abandoning its dreams of evolving with a Slowpoke, all in the hopes to help Jesse win. Though Cloister is stronger now, it's clearly not accustomed to its new size and bulk. Battling off against a Cloister with years of experience as an evolved Pokémon is showing its immaturity. Cloister wins barely, but then is defeated by Usine Starmie with a powerful Thunderbolt, which leaves Cloister badly paralyzed. Jesse's unable to send out another Pokemon and is disqualified. Jesse's stunned, unable to even say a word, let alone recall her Pokemon. It's Meowth that jumps out of the stands and yells at Jesse to snap her back to reality. Jesse, don't you see what Cloyster did for you? It knew how bad you wanted to win, and look what happened! James forfeits his next battle to help Jesse with Cloyster, using the Salvio weed he collected back in the Orange Archipelago. Yusin goes on to win the tournament and the coveted Mystic Water. Jesse is overcome with guilt, 
If not for her obsession with winning, Cloyster wouldn't have forced itself to evolve and end up hurt, and James wouldn't have had to quit the tournament. She apologizes to James, saying he probably could have won if not for her. He says, You have no idea what winning costs, what it can cost your Pokémon. It's a trainer's job to have the strength to know when to quit. She thinks back to how Bruno told her trainers needed to be strong, and Jesse finally realizes what he meant. She apologizes through tears to Cloyster, and has no idea how it will ever forgive her. But Cloyster, thanks to Meowth's translation, tells her, Jesse, don't cry. Don't you see? My dream really did come true. I thought evolving with a slowpoke would mean I could never be alone again. But knowing how much you care for me, I now know that being alone was never possible. No matter what I am, I'll be happy as long as we're together. Jessie hugs Cloyster close to her and promises to never let winning cloud her judgment again. After the tournament, Jessie thanks James again, asking if there's anything she can do to repay him. James asks Jessie to send Chansey to his grandparents along with his Gyarados. He believes she can help Gyarados and all the other Pokémon there recover. Jessie and Chansey agree, with Chansey entrusting the egg she's been carrying to Jessie. Jesse and James enter Cianwood when the weather clears and fairies are active again, and head to the gym. The gym leader, Chuck, has just returned from the Gala region where he was training with a young bee. When challenged, he's very excited, as he borrowed a Pokémon from Galar to train his own in some new moves. James and Meowth watch in the stands, with James holding the egg for Jesse. Lickitung also insists on sitting in the stands with James, wanting a second breakfast of James's Pokémon food. The battle begins with Arbok facing off against Machop. The tiny fighting Pokémon packs a big punch with Karate Chop, but Arbok's resistance allows it to shrug it off and defeat Machop with Poison Stings and its newly learned Earthquake. However, against Poliwrath, Arbok has a bit more trouble. Earthquake is not nearly as effective, and Poliwrath is able to take out Arbok after it's put to sleep with a surprise hypnosis. Jesse then sends out Yanma, believing the flying type to have an advantage over Poliwrath. However, the Dragonfly's wing attacks and sonic booms seem to only infuriate the fighting tadpole, and Yanma is taken out by a string of powerful waterfalls. Jessie hesitates on deciding her next Pokémon. Lickitung, Sneasel, and Cloyster are all weak to fighting types. What should she do? However, before she can make up her mind, the fighting spirit of the dojo and the challenge posed by so many fighting types seems to have an effect on the egg that Chansey left with Jessie. Being held in James's arms while Jesse battles, it suddenly hatches. The Pokémon inside jumps out and charges straight to the battlefield. It's a Tyrogue, and it looks like Tyrogue was literally born to battle. Jesse's worried about pushing it too hard though, considering what just happened with Cloyster in the World Cup, but Jesse can tell Tyrogue wants to fight, and nothing she says could stop it. Using an immediate combination of Fake Out and Tackle, Tyrogue defeats Chuck's damaged Poliwrath. It all comes down to their final Pokémon, Tyrogue versus Surfetched. Though Surfetched, borrowed from the Galar region, is massive compared to the baby Pokémon, its slash and brick breaks hit nothing but air. Tyrogue uses its small size to dodge. With focus energy activated, Tyrogue unleashes a critical brick break on Surfetched, seemingly having learned the move by watching Surfetched perform it only once. Thanks to her new prodigy of a baby Pokémon, Jessie has won her fifth badge, the Storm Badge. Taking a ferry back to Olivine directly, Jessie, James, and Meowth travel past it, through Rikishi Town, and return to Ecruteak City. The Ghost-type specialist is back and ready for a battle. Morty does ask Jessie if she knows where the gym's former student Karen went, but Jessie has no idea. Before the gym battle, the trio rest at the Pokémon Center, which gives Jessie a chance to plan her strategy. Sneasel will definitely be helpful in the upcoming battle, but she wonders if she should catch a Ghost-type herself before the match. Just then, Lickitung jumps out of its Pokéball again, and runs over to James wanting even more food. Apparently it can't get enough, and Jessie has noticed how close it's gotten to James in such a short time. James suddenly has a thought. As Jesse mentions wanting a Ghost-type, he remembers how badly Haunter wanted to battle more in the Orange League. Knowing that his destiny may not be a future full of battles, he tells Jesse that perhaps Haunter would be better off with her. The two agree, though it's still a tough decision to make, and decide to trade Pokémon. Jesse gives James her Lickitung, and when James brings Haunter back from his grandparents, he gives it to Jesse through the trading machine. 
Perhaps Haunter will be just what Jessie needs in her next gym battle. Lickitung, on the other hand, is more than happy to be sent to James's mansion, where it becomes fast friends with the family chef. No more stealing snow for Lickitung. Now it can eat 10 meals a day like it always dreamed. It would definitely take a millionaire to satisfy Lickitung's appetite. The next day at the gym, Jessie has a 3 on 3 battle with Morty. Morty's Ghastly faces off against Jessie's Yanma. The two Pokemon are exceptionally fast and seem to dodge anything the other throws at them. Jessie orders Yanma to use a Sonic Boom and appears to land a direct hit, but Jessie forgets ghost types are immune to normal attacks. That moment of hesitation allows Ghastly to defeat Yanma with a Nightshade. Jessie sends out Sneasel, who defeats Ghastly with one quick feint attack. Jessie realizes something after Morty returns Ghastly. Sneasel battled without demanding eggs. While Sneasel pretends to have just forgotten, Jessie realizes that even Sneasel has begun to warm up to her. Using a newly learned Night Slash, it defeats Morty's Haunter shortly after with relative ease. Just as it looks like Sneasel will sweep Morty's team, his Gengar comes out and uses Curse. Spending the rest of the battle simply dodging Sneasel's attacks, eventually the Ice-type succumbs to the damage and faints. Jessie decides this is the perfect time to let James's Haunter out, but when she throws her Pokeball, it isn't Haunter, it's Gengar. Haunter, unbeknownst to Jessie and James, evolved into Gengar when he was traded for Lickitung. The newly evolved ghost type laughs to itself, finding the shocked looks on everyone's faces hilarious. The ultimate fake-out prank. The two Gengars exchange nightshades, but Morty's secret move Shadow Ball seems to turn the tide in his favor. Jessie's Gengar is hit directly and falls to the ground. However, Morty doesn't realize his opponent has a secret move of his own, pretending to be hit by attacks. When Morty's Gengar lets its guard down, it's hit from behind by a nightshade and faints. Thanks to Gengar's prankster ways, it helps Jessie win her sixth badge, the Fog Badge. In Mahogany Town, Jessie challenges the gym leader Price to a battle. At this time, Price's Pilo Swine is still lost in the mountains, and thus Price is as icy to people as ever. He still believes that Pokemon and humans can't really be friends. With no interest in chit chat, he battles Jesse immediately with Seal, Dugong, and Lapras. Jesse begins with Cloyster vs. Seal, and the evolved water type defeats the tiny Seal with ease thanks to its spike cannon. However, against Price's Dugong, Cloyster falls to its swift movement and powerful double edge. Before Jesse can choose her next Pokemon, Tyrogue jumps out of its Pokeball, as Jesse's Pokemon seem to do so easily and so often. The fighting type is gone almost a week without battling, and it's itching for a fight, and Dugong is taken out by a powerful Brick Break. Finally, Price sends out his Lapras. Tyrogue, facing off against a Pokemon quadruple its height, doesn't hesitate to charge the giant Ice Nessie. The tiny fighter is too small for Lapras to hit effectively with Ice Beams, and it runs around her like Sora fighting a behemoth. With Focus Energy charged Brick Breaks, Tyrogue defeats Lapras and wins Jessie yet another badge, the Glacier Badge. I'd say this baby Pokemon is really carrying its weight, but it doesn't really weigh much. Side note, before we head into Blackthorn, I just want to say a lot of people commented, and yes, I made a mistake and mixed up Claire and Lance's ages. I thought Lance was like a young prodigy. My bad. So let's just pretend that Claire is older, okay? Sorry. Now back to the thing. The trio leaves Mahogany and travels through the ice caves to Blackthorn, but on the outskirts of the city, Jessie hesitates. Meowth asks her why she's stopped. She's been so eager to battle every gym leader up till now, what's different here? Jessie tells them about how she battled Claire once before, and how humiliated she was when she lost. Jessie's worried she hasn't grown enough, that she might make a fool of herself against Claire again. Luckily, Jessie isn't traveling alone anymore. She has friends right there to tell her the truth. Jessie, if you're a weak trainer, then I must be pathetic, James says. We'll be watching and cheering for you in the stands, won't we? Meowth, that's right. Jessie can't possibly turn around now with friends eager to see her battle, can she? After a quick stop at the Pokemon Center to make some preparations, they head to the gym. At the Blackthorn Gym, Jessie learns that Lance and Liza are gone. Apparently, the former students of Claire were both able to beat her after Jessie's first attempt at the gym. Claire is thus in a pretty bad mood. When she recognizes Jessie, she says, Great, the little girl found her way back here. Let me guess, you want a battle? Yes, and when we're through, you won't be calling me a little girl anymore. Don't think because those two beat me that you stand a chance. You still want to take me on? Fine, let's do it. 
In the three-on-three -three battle, Arbok begins facing off against Claire's Gyarados. Well, looks like that little snake has grown up, Claire says. Not like it will matter. But Jesse doesn't give in to the taunt, and calmly orders Arbok to use the move Haze. The battlefield is covered in smoke. Gyarados dives under the water to avoid the attack, and Arbok quietly follows it in. With the battle now underwater, Claire assumes Gyarados will have an advantage, but that's exactly according to Jesse's plan. Arbok's most powerful attack, Earthquake, can't be used against Gyarados normally, but when used underwater, it shakes the arena and creates massive whirlpools and tidal waves. Arbok slithers out of the water right after using the move, but Gyarados is tossed around like clothes in a washing machine. Not only does Arbok defeat Gyarados in the water, but it does so using a move that normally doesn't affect it. And you thought Pikachu defeating a Rhydon was crazy anime logic. Smart move! Rhydon's horn acts just like a lightning rod! Claire is impressed by how much Arbok has grown, but against her Dragonair, the poisonous snake has a much harder time. Though they exchange poison stings and slams, Dragonair ultimately defeats Arbok with a powerful Dragon Breath. When Cloyster comes out, Jesse assumes the Ice type will defeat the dragon with a single Ice Beam, but Dragonair doesn't give Cloyster the chance. Cloyster is defeated almost instantly with a surprise Thunder. Jesse is down to her last Pokemon. She sends out Chansey. Yes, having retrieved her during the quick stop at the Pokemon Center, Jesse knows Chansey is ready to finish this. Jesse orders Chansey to attack, and Claire chuckles at the big pink ball waddling towards her dragon. But before she can regain her composure, it's already too late. Chansey wasn't using a weak pound or double slap like Claire assumed. It was an ice punch. Claire is taken completely by surprise, and Dragonair is defeated. It all comes down to Claire's ace, Kingdra. You've made some good moves so far, little girl. But this is where your clever little tricks will end you. Claire orders Kingdra to use Rain Dance, and in the rain, Kingdra's swift swim makes it too fast for Chansey to hit. You'll never land a single Ice Punch on him. Maybe not, but Ice Punch isn't all we have, Jesse says, and she orders Chansey to use a special move. One that used to haunt Jesse. One that almost made her give up her dreams when she herself couldn't learn it back at the nurse's school. Jesse orders Chansey to use Sing. Even against the loud maelstrom of rain and whirlpools around her, Chansey's song breaks through. The fierce battle-ready eyes of Kingdra soon begin to droop as sleep overtakes it. Asleep and completely vulnerable, Chansey waddles over to the edge of the platform and stands above Kingdra. She holds an egg bomb high, and Jesse says, Claire, why don't you give up and save Kingdra the pain and suffering? Ask my Sneasel. An egg bomb from Chansey is nothing to sneeze at. Claire's face nearly bursts from anger, but even she can admit when she's been beaten. I surrender, she says, and recalls her sleeping Kingdra. Both Claire and Jesse are stunned silent. Neither one can believe this, but Jesse won! She actually beat Claire! Though Claire looks five seconds away from having a temper tantrum, she hands Jesse her badge. The Rising Badge. If only Jessie could tell herself, back when she lost to Claire, that one day she'd be strong enough to defeat her. Though James and Meowth run out of the stands to congratulate Jessie, she can't help but wonder, where did Liza and Lance go after defeating Claire? Jessie has all eight badges. The Silver Conference is not only on the horizon, but it also means she gets to return home. Her snowy village is not too far from Silvertown, where the league competition takes place. Jesse, James, and Meowth head to the Silver Conference together, returning to the snowy village on the way so Jesse's foster parents can travel with them and cheer for their daughter at the League. They pass through the ho -Oh Shrine and a vibrant lake with many Slowpoke and Shelter before entering Silvertown. It is packed with trainers. There are also a ton of vendors, with James almost getting swindled into buying a bunch of fake badges that are clearly just bottle caps. Luckily, Meowth is there to stop him from wasting his money, and they follow Jesse into the registration building. After signing in, Jesse learns that the Silver Conference begins with three preliminary rounds of 1v1 battles. She will have to win all three if she wants to battle in the main event and have a shot at winning the conference. The first one-on-one -on -one battle is won quickly by Cloyster, and the second battle is even easier. Jesse can't even see the trainer's face, but the hooded figure's Wobbuffet puts up almost no fight at all as Arbok defeats it. Jesse wonders why the hooded figure barely fought back, but shakes it off, happy to have had an easy match. Jesse's third preliminary battle is the only one that gives her some trouble. 
A trainer by the name of Wings Alexander has a hoot hoot that may look cute, but even with the type disadvantage, it almost defeats Sneasel. Jesse is just able to win thanks to Sneasel's powder snow slowing down hoot hoot. Having qualified for the top 48, the trainers are put into 16 groups of three. The three trainers will battle a round robin to see which one comes out on top. When Jesse approaches the desk to find out who her opponents are, she can't believe her eyes. The other two trainers in her block are Liza and Karen. Surprised to see her two rivals at the league, Liza greets Jesse with a huge smile. Karen, on the other hand, gives Jesse nothing but a cocky smirk. Liza tells Jesse how happy she is that she was able to make it here. Lance trounced Claire not long after Jesse left Blackthorn the first time, but it took Liza several more attempts to best her. Jesse introduces her to James and Meowth, who head back to the stands to watch the first match in their block, Liza versus Karen. But the match is over almost in the blink of an eye. Liza thought her Charmander, Charmeleon, and Charizard were bringing a lot of firepower, but they're all defeated by one of Karen's Pokémon. And what's worse, it's one that none of them have ever seen before. Karen clearly succeeded in finding something darker than the ghost type. Jesse's first battle is with Liza, but her Pokémon, even after a night at the Pokémon Center, are still worn out from battling Karen's mysterious ace. Though it gives Jesse no pleasure, she defeats all three of Liza's weakened fire types using only her cloister. The next day, against Karen, Jesse uses Arbok, Gengar, and Tyrogue. Karen sends out her ace, and Jesse finally hears its name, Houndoom. The Pokémon is a member of a still not fully understood Pokémon type, the Dark type. Jesse, not fully aware of what this type can do, even after traveling with Sneasel, sends out Gengar, thinking he can stay above and out of Houndoom's range. But Jesse makes a terrible mistake, and dodging Gengar's Nightshade, Houndoom unleashes a super effective Dark Pulse, taking out Gengar with one shot. Up next, Arbok's Earthquake does a lot of damage, but when Jesse tries to recall Arbok after it's burned by Houndoom's Flamethrower, it's defeated by a surprise pursuit. Jesse didn't even know that move existed. Jesse's down to her last Pokémon, and Karen's ace is still standing strong. It looks unbeatable, but the word unbeatable doesn't mean anything to Tyrogue. The Pokémon, who is literally born to fight, emerges. And as even Karen doesn't know everything about the Dark type yet, she's surprised by how little damage Dark Pulse does against the fighting type. All it seems to do is piss off Tyrogue, whose focus energy looks more like him stewing in anger. A critical hit Brick Break shocks the whole crowd as it defeats Houndoom. The baby Pokémon shouts in victory, and standing over the fainted body of Houndoom, he shines bright like the sun. He's evolving, and into... a Hitmonlee. The kicking Pokémon is known for having extremely high attack, and shows this off to everyone. Against Karen's Gloom, Hitmonlee high jump kicks it so hard the smelly Pokémon gets shot right into the stands. And Karen's final Pokémon, a weak little Murkrow, can't land a single Drill Peck before Hitmonlee brick breaks it straight down into the ground, cracking the arena floor. It looks like Karen put a little too much effort into her ace Houndoom, as her other two Pokémon are pretty weak. Hitmonlee wins Jesse the match, and she advances forward to the top 16. Karen leaves, feeling ashamed, but does learn the importance of all of her Pokémon, and that she can't just abandon one type because she gets bored. She re-adds Gengar to her party, vowing to never turn her back on him again, even if she becomes a Dark-type specialist. That's why she doesn't only have Dark-types in her team in the Elite Four. After a long night of resting, Jessie finds out her opponent in the 3 vs 3 Top 16 match is… oh no, it's Lance. She must face off against the very trainer who Liza could never beat, and who already surpassed Claire as a dragon trainer. Jesse is pretty nervous. Against Lance, Jesse uses Cloyster, Chansey, and Sneasel. They're up against Lance's team of dragon Pokémon, with his Dragonite being undefeated in the Silver Conference so far. Jesse feels a little more confident going in though, as she's bringing two Ice types, and Chansey comes ready with her Ice Punch. Lance's dragons should be no problem, right? In the Top 16 battle, Lance enters the arena, quiet and stoic as ever. He's the favorite to win now that Karen's defeated, but all eyes are on Jesse. How will she fare against the young dragon prodigy? Lance sends out his Dragonite, and Jesse sends out Cloyster. 
Lance is known to begin each match with an extreme speed, so Jessie believes Cloyster's massive defense will withstand it. And she's right! Cloyster withstands Dragonite's physical attack, but Lance doesn't even flinch at the tactic. Perhaps mirroring Claire's strategy, Dragonite uses a Thunder which wipes out Cloyster before it even had a chance to use Ice Beam. It seems obvious this isn't Lance's first battle against an Ice type. Jesse sends out Chansey next, who's also unable to dodge extreme speed, but is able to get in one good Ice Punch. It doesn't seem to do the damage Jesse expected, though, as Dragonite shrugs it off. She tries to order Chansey to use Sing, but Dragonite drowns it out with a loud slam attack against the arena floor. Chansey then tries to use Egg Bomb, but Dragonite slaps the eggs away like they're nothing. Lance's Dragonite defeats Chansey with an immensely powerful slam. The reality of battling Lance is setting in. It's as though he's prepared for every strategy, every attack Jesse throws at him. Even Chansey's Egg Bombs did seemingly nothing against the dragon. Sneasel enters the arena last, Jesse's only hope at winning, and it's fueled by the desire to avenge Chansey and defeat the dragon who disrespected eggs. The Ice type should have a huge advantage against the Dragon and Flying type, but Dragonite's presence is overwhelming. It wastes no time as the match begins. It charges forward with an extreme speed, sending Sneasel crashing into the arena wall. Lance has used Dragonite's speed to win every match up until now, and even though Jesse knew it was coming, she and Sneasel couldn't do anything to stop it. Sneasel's legs shake as it tries to stand up. It shoots out a Powder Snow in an attempt to hit Dragonite and slow it down, but the Dragon flies high and avoids the attack with ease. Sneasel tries Powder Snow once more, but Dragonite unleashes a devastating Hyper Beam, defeating the Dark-type. Jesse's lost, but as the tournament continues, ultimately no one was able to defeat Lance's Dragonite. Not even in the finals, when Lance faces off against an up-and-comer named Drake, is his Dragonite defeated. Lance is crowned champion of the Silver Conference, and one day very soon, he'll become a member of the Elite Four. At such a young age, this future champion is seen as a real rising star. Though the newcomer Drake lost in the finals, he puts up a good fight. Perhaps even inspired by Lance's dragons, Drake will one day get a Dragonite of his own and end up the head gym leader of the Orange League when Lorelei moves on to the Elite Four. Karen may have been eliminated early, but her dark types will continue to make a strong impression as one day she rises to become a member of the Elite Four. Though Jessie is sad to have lost, she's happy to have made it so far into the competition, beating a lot of really strong trainers along the way. Whether she has the trophy or not, losing can't take away all that she's learned and all she's experienced through her Johto journey. With her Pokemon, James, Meowth, and her family by her side, she returns to the snowy village. They arrive to a warm welcome from the village, and Jessie remembers all of the random jobs she tried when she was younger. Nurse, designer, model, dancer, all to try and win the love of a mother who left her long ago. Now she's surrounded by friends and family who are excited for her, even though she lost. How could she possibly feel sad? As the town celebrates, Jessie, it turns out, had more than just a warm welcome waiting for her. She's also given a letter addressed directly to her. It apparently arrived not too long ago. Jessie, with James and Meowth looking over her shoulder, opens the envelope. It, it's from Aston. A boy I used to know, Jessie says. I haven't spoken with him since dance school when he left to go to... <gasps> what is it, Jessie? James asks. Inside of the envelope is a letter. And something else. A contest pass. Jessie picks it up and reads the letter aloud. It's only one line. Meet me in Hoenn. And Hoenn is where our story will continue, in about a million months. But until then, thank you for watching and following the adventures of Jessie, James, and Meowth. Don't forget to subscribe for more of this series, as well as other videos for different cartoons and games. Thank you for watching. What did you discover? We snuck into the League and battled her. She won't pose any threat. We'll be able to defeat them both in Hoenn and steal that Meowth for Madam Boss. Good, good. But stay vigilant. This assignment could get ugly. So make sure you... prepare for trouble. Oh, don't worry. We'll make it double. <laughs>